And now I invite uh, Professor Didier Fassin as a keynote speaker of this conference, um, who will be introduced shortly by Alicia. So, it is time for the keynote speaker, Professor of Social Sciences at the Institute for Advanced Studies of Princeton and Director des Etudes at the Col des Hautes Etudes in Paris, Didier Fassin, with his studies on the moral and political framework of contemporary societies, inspire all of us and pave the way, I would say, if I'm correct, to an anthropology that engages with theory, civil society, and of course, with the reality of our daily lives. Thank you so much. Grazie mille. Buonasera. It is a great honor to have been invited to deliver the keynote lecture of the 14th Biennale Conference of the European Association of Social Anthropologists. And I'm grateful to the conveners of this event at uh, the Università di Milano Bicocca, in particular, uh, Silvia Vignato, as well as to the executive committee of IASA, uh, notably Thomas Ilan Eriksson, for having given me this wonderful opportunity. It is indeed of special significance for me, not only because being exiled, a golden exile, I must admit, in North America, I consider important to maintain close relationship with my European colleagues and friends, but also because in the present moment of political and moral crisis in Europe, the convergence of anthropological voices is of a major relevance. I will offer tonight a few reflections in defense of critique. And as I was driven this morning from the airport to my hotel, going through Via Gramsci, Via Pasolini, and unexpectedly Via Engels, <laughs> I felt these were auspicious signs. <laughs> critique seems to be under attack these days, and the critique of critique has become common practice among intellectuals and scientists, as well as commentators and politicians. Considering current external pressures along with internal offensive to which the human sciences are subjected, and reckoning equally the disaffection towards and defections of critiques within academic institutions, what could, one could even wonder whether critique has not entered a critical situation. In other words, critique might not only be criticized, but also in crisis. It is certainly neither the first nor the last time that this is the case, but it is worth wondering how singular the present moment is and what particular meaning it has. However, as the quote apocryphally attributed to Winston Churchill goes, one should never let a good crisis go to waste. Definite contests and possible decline of critique can be seized as an opportunity for a fertile debate leading to new openings within the human sciences as well as with, within the public sphere. And referring to a phrase this time correctly credited to John Locke, the motive to change is always some uneasiness. Let us then use the discomfort around critique as an occasion for its reassessment. This is the spirit that animates my reflection. Critique is not a fortress under siege one would have to defend, but a land in fallow one needs constantly to recede. If properly understood, answered, and countered, Criticisms directed at critique can clarify its function and strengthen its legitimacy. Indeed, the polysemic term endurance of my title simultaneously means 
that critique repeatedly undergoes ordeals, that it bears them with patience, and that it continues to exist beyond them. The state of affairs is true for the humanities and the social sciences at large, but it has certain idiosyncratic expressions in anthropology. I will examine these expressions in more detail while not losing sight of the fact that they pertain to a broader picture. It is the very status, role, and form of critique that are at stake in these disputes, hence the need to ponder them thoroughly. Analyzing critique and its contemporary fate, I will first identify some arguments frequently opposed to it. Second, try to clarify its concept and distinguish its various trends. Third, focus more specifically on what it means for ethnography and how it relates the ethnographer to its publics. My argument is that we must resist both the facile disqualification of critique as a practice passé and the hyperbolic use of critique as a mere mantra and that anthropology in general and ethnography in particular can help us succeed in this endeavor. Against the unbearable lightness of being that paradoxically characterizes certain forms of alleged radicalism as well as certain retreats in an ivory tower, I will attempt to give some weight to a critical approach of the way in which we deal with the world. I trust that it will progressively become manifest that through this inquiry into critique, I will definitely be uh, uh, in line uh, with the motto of this conference about uh, talking about anthropological, of anthropological legacies in light of the importance of critical thinking in the history of the discipline and about human futures as the somber times we live in render this critical thinking more necessary than ever. Hoping that this will not be regarded as an intellectual chauvinism or national score setting, let me begin with a discussion of a text by a French social scientist which has received a lot of attention in academia and beyond, the 2004 article published by Bruno Latour in Critical Inquiry entitled, Why Has Critique Run Out of Steam? What if intellectuals were one war late, one critical, one critique late, writes our excellent colleague, who affirms that it has been a long time since the very notion of avant-garde passed away, pushed aside by other forces, moved to the rear guard. Why such a far-reaching utterance? One learns that this admittedly depressing reflection stems from a series of epiphanies experienced by the author while reading an editorial of the New York Times and talking to a neighbor in his Bourbonnais village, village which suddenly made him aware of the unwavering denial of climate change by Republican pundits and the conspiracy theories surrounding the destruction of the Twin Towers, respectively. Could it be, our colleague anxiously wonder, wonders, that the challenging of a scientifically established fact in the first case and of an empirically validated event in the second be the consequence of critiques having gone too far or being heard too literally. After all, he argues, is it not the social scientists, including himself, who have claimed that reality is socially constructed and that behind apparently objective statements about the world, one had to uncover hidden prejudices and interests. Moreover, between the discourses of denialist or conspiracist and the theories of Foucault or Bourdieu, is there not, quote, something troublingly similar in the structure of the explanation in the first movement of disbelief and then in the wheeling of causal explanation coming out of the deep dark below, unquote. Thus, according to Latour, not only have Foucault's archeological method or Bourdieu's concept of doxa 
inserted doubts in the minds of suggestible individuals, but also the way of thinking of these lay people has a family resemblance in Wittgenstein's terms with the philosopher's and sociologist's intellectual enterprise. They share the same suspicious perspective on the world. To avoid further defeats of reason and hopefully correct the coming intellectual disaster, Latour proposes, as, quote, the lights of enlightenment are being slowly turned off, a stubborn realist attitude focused on matters of concerns, not matters of fact, unquote. Ironic twist. The author of We Have Never Been Modern is now insisting that we eventually become modern. It is certainly remarkable that a social scientist, and moreover, a social student of science, would hold accountable his entire profession for the existence of denialist mindsets and conspiracy theories, as if historians had not supplied multiple examples of such beliefs as far as in the past as archives can go, in any case, long before the social science were even invented, and as if anthropologists had not provided ample evidence of not so different worldviews sometimes interpreted as witchcraft in various remote societies, undoubtedly before the natives could read their work. Is it not to hastily putting the blame on and simultaneously giving credit to social scientists for the treacherous influence of their knowledge? Is it not granting them too much indignity as well as too much honor? But even if we accept Latour's confident interpretation of the impact of the social sciences, in other words, even if it were the case that social scientists had such an influence on people's worldviews, world could they take the pretext of an alleged misunderstanding of their work to relinquish their critical position? Have prejudices and interests disappeared or has their study become less relevant because some would precisely hide economic and political interest behind their denial of climate change while others would revealingly express prejudices about global powers, power relations through their conspiracy theories regarding terrorist attacks. In contrast with this disavowal, one can think of how another scholar who has also written about the fate of intellectuals, Edward Said, responds in, in the 1995 afterword of Orientalism to critiques who accused him of representing, quote, the entire West as an enemy of the Arab and Islamic, and for that matter, the Iranian, Chinese, Indian, and many other non-European peoples who suffered Western colonialism and prejudice, unquote, and contended that, quote, to criticize Orientalism is in effect to be a supporter of Islamism or Muslim fund fundamentalism, unquote. Instead of accepting that this, that is critical reading of Western prejudices regarding the Middle Eastern and Asian world could fuel animosity between peoples and even nourish religious extremism, and rather than renouncing his decisive critique of Orientalism, Said maintains and even expands, expands his analysis. He insists that all societies develop the same interpretive process which involves the identities of different others, whether they be outsiders and refugees or apostates and infidels. And that his book, quote, can only be read as a defense of Islam by suppressing half of the argument according to which even the primitive community we belong to Natalie is not immune from the interpretive contest, and what appears in the West to be an emergence, return to, or resurgence of Islam is in fact a struggle in Islamic societies over the very definition of Islam." Unquote. Two decades later, as distorted representation of Muslims and Islamic societies have overwhelmed the public sphere in Western societies, this reading could not be more pertinent. Thus, contrary to his French colleague, the Palestinian scholar did not disown his critical theory because he considered it had been misunderstood. He explicated and reaffirmed it. Critique needs openness, but it also requires consistency. 
Denialist attitudes and conspiracy theories have certainly been my lot during the six years I worked in, on the South African AIDS crisis. In this country, most severely struck by the epidemic with chilling statistics indicating in the early 2000s that one adult out of four was infected, the president and part of his government disputed both the fact that the virus could explain the expansion of the disease, privileging instead the role of poverty, and the fact that antiretroviral drugs could be active other than by pro producing deadly side effects. Furthermore, they successively attributed to the pharmaceutical industry, the white elite, and the Western world the malicious intention to ignore the actual cause of the epidemic and its link with the apartheid, to stigmatize black people by blaming their sexual behavior rather than their social condition, and to use them as guinea pigs to test drugs whose efficacy and innocuousness were not established. In brief, denial and conspiracy at their highest. But these representations were not limited to allegedly disturbed or cynical politicians. Polls showed that they were shared by a majority of, of the African population in the country. And this was also what I observed in the townships where I was doing field work as well as in the academic meetings which I attended. So what should be the role of the anthropologist confronted with such situation? Does he have to choose between constructivism and realism? This is not an, illusion, an illusory alternative. In the first years of the research, I realized that each time I presented my analysis of the South African AIDS crisis, I was su suspected or overtly accused of being a cryptic denialist or conspiracist, as if to interpret was to justify a common argument among the critiques of critique. This incomprehension then led me to systematically start my lectures with a cautionary statement asserting my belief in the existence and significance of HIV, just as one declares to have no conflict of interest when publishing a scientific article. After having articulated this creed, I could at last begin developing my analysis with a slight chance to be heard. However, I did not have to decide whether AIDS was a construction or a reality, whether it should be understood as a matter of fact or a matter of concern. It was intricately both. Exerting a critical thinking was precisely relating the two without having to fall into the nihilist constructionist mocked by Jan Hacking in The Social Construction of What, or the naive realism debunked long before by Ludwig Fleck in Genesis and Development of a Scientific Fact. To do so, I had to take seriously both the official version and the dissenting position about the epidemic so as to understand what they meant, implied, and revealed. For the controversy was not just scientific, it was political and ethical, and it, has, it had historical and sociological ramifications. Even more than the black box that the social studies of science rightly explore, the dark matter in which it is embedded, or perhaps more properly, which surrounds and underlies it, appears to be, albeit much less investigated, of major relevance. In the case of AIDS, the official theory established a biological link between the virus and the infection and a behavioral connection between an individual risk and a potential contamination but it did not account for the rapid expansion of the epidemic and the racial differentiation of its distribution within the population, except in the implicit or explicit blaming of the victims. Leaving out the social conditions of possibility of transmission of the virus and actualization of the risk, the orthodox view ignored the political economy of the epidemic, as has so often been the case with medical theories. Yet, the extremely high prevalence rates observed in mining areas were related to the organization of this industry characterized by the concentration of half a million male workers living in single sex barracks and the installation on site of bars and so-called hotspots attracting impoverished young women from the countryside. Similarly, the pauperization of rural areas and the high unemployment in the cities left many female migrants 
little alternative to what was then called survival sex. These social shortcomings of this orthodox theory facilitated the reception of heterodox theses that regarded biological and behavioral explanation as deceptive screens eluding deeper causes and focused instead on poverty at the risk of jeopardizing curative and, preventing inter and preventive interventions. Moreover, the reasons for the success of dissident interpretations in, in the African communities were to be found in the distrust accumulated over a century toward public health, which had repeatedly been used as an instrument to stigmatize its members and a justification for segregating them. These issues surfaced in my conversation with black intellectuals as well as township dwellers who were steadily evoking secret schemes to eliminate the surplus population. Political economy and medical history thus provided clues to apprehend the AIDS controversy. The allegedly irrational be beliefs so often ridiculed could be interpreted. In doing so, anthropology was definitely not contesting the scientific truth of the biologists and the physicians, even if it illuminated its blind spots. But it was giving existence to another sort of truth, not scientific, but political and ethical, that of the black population and its historical experience of inequality and violence. Making sense of what seems peculiar and providing intelligibility to what appears to be incomprehensible, looking into dragons, as Clifford Goetz has it, is certainly one of the most thrilling tasks of, uh, that anthropologists can accomplish, especially in our time of Manichaean interpretations of the world. In discussing at some length our colleagues, our colleagues' influential article, I have tried to unravel certain features that are frequently found in the critique of critique. The irreconcilable opposition between reality and its representation, the contest of the social construction of facts and the nostalgic return to positivism, the overarching tirades against heterogeneous and sometimes contradictory social theories, the illusion of or even dismissal of history and politics in accounting for states of the world, the insinuation that critical thinking might, be, might dangerously infiltrate society, sometimes the mea culpa typical of converts who reject their former faith. Finally, the claim that the critique of critique is actually the ultimate form of critical thinking. For what it has been, for what it has been since its incep inception and for what it is still, it should hardly be a surprise that anthropology would be a prime candidate for these attacks. A well-oiled exercise, the critique of critique, however, takes diverse forms and adopts different styles depending on the social field where it deploys its artillery. Sophisticated in the humanities, excluding in the method-driven social sciences, demagogic in the political domain. Within the humanities, Jacques Rancière has developed an interesting argument regarding what he calls the misadventures of critical thought in the emancipated spectator. In his view, from Guy Debord to Peter Sloterdijk, social critique in the postmodern age has twisted and even inverted its initial project, rejecting the very idea of any reality to counterpose to the reign of appearances. Consequently, it, it states, this discourse states, that all critique is immediately absorbed and disarmed by consumerism and neoliberalism, as has been argued by Luc Boltonski and F. Capello in The New Spirit of Capitalism. For the French philosopher, this left-wing melancholy and the right-wing frenzy are two sides of the same coin. I quote him. On the side of method-driven social sciences, whether economics, political science, quantitative sociology, or experimental psychology, critique is less attacked than marginalized and repudi or repudiated. Positivism leaves little space to epistemological and social critique within these fields. But its undisputed, undisputed success in scientific institutions, 
the public sphere and the political realm does not leave much space either to such critique outside these fields. According to one of its leading experts, Gary King, the rise of big data thus inaugurates what he calls a dramatic transformation in the social sciences from studying problems to solving them. As shown by George Steinmetz, this is not the first time social scientists celebrate the glory of positivism. Yet, Barack Obama's 2015 executive order to incorporate behavioral science into all federal programs indicates a new advance in the public fortune of positivism. And finally, among politicians, criticizing critiques is both a disqualification of the content of their argument and a, and a demagogic appeal to common anti-intellectualism analyzed long ago by Richard Hofstadter. After the Paris attacks, Manuel Valls, Prime Minister of France, assimilated on several occasions, quote, cultural and sociological explanations to excuses, adding that, quote, to explain is already to be willing to excuse, a rhetoric that is not without reminding of Margaret Thatcher's famous, there is no such thing as society. The manifestation of the disqualification of critique are thus diverse, from refutation to ignorance, from contesting to bullying, but is there even an agreement among its critiques about what critique is? In fact, for many, it seems to be more an epistemological and political annoyance than a method or a state of mind. Some explanation for this hostility may be found in the history of the world. The word critique is of relatively late introduction in English at the beginning of the 18th century. It means the art of criticism, a slightly older term itself derived from critique, with a C, the one who passes judgment, all these substantives, substantives stemming from Middle French critique and beyond Greek kritikos, able to make judgment, from crinine, to separate, to distinguish. As noted by Raymond Williams in his keywords, criticism, criticism has a predominant general sense of fault finding, as well as a specialized sense in relation to art and literature. There is thus a dual connotation of the word. It suggests negative evaluation, that's the normative aspect, and authoritative judgment, and that's the social dimension. One should therefore not only try to avoid the reduction of criticism to fault finding, but also beware of the use of authority under the appearance of neutral abstraction and generalizations. The noun critique, has inherited this ambiguous meaning as the common sense of depreciation and the social background of authority still coexist. So how to deal with this tension? In his 1978 lecture before the French Society of Philosophy titled What is Critique? Foucault, rather than directly answering the question, chose to substitute the idea of critical attitude for a strict definition of critique. And to characterize this attitude, he found, as you know, his inspiration in Kant's famous text, What is Enlightenment? In which the critical attitude is presented as an emancipation of the subject that is ethical even before being political, since the liberation from oneself is a precondition for the questioning of domination, what Foucault names self-government. But is there only one way to achieve this emancipation? Is there a, a homogeneous mode of thinking that can be called critique? It would certainly be difficult to contend that Marx and Nietzsche, or Freud and Wittgenstein, had similar conception of what critique is. In fact, their respective legacies have generated diff quite different strands in our own discipline, which are all claiming for themselves the title of critical anthropology, they are champions having a hard time recognizing each other as legitimate critics. 
To account for these differences and settle the disputes regarding what is a legitimate critique, David Owen undertakes to establish a fundamental distinction, quote, there are at least two logically distinct forms of self-imposed non-physical constraint on our capacity for self-government, being held captive by an ideology, that is, false consciousness, or being held captive by a picture or perspective, that is, what, what one might call restricted consciousness, unquote. There are therefore two corresponding form of, forms of critique. The first critique is directed to freeing us from captivity to an ideology. However distant they may seem, the Marxist and Freudian approaches share the, the same project. And the Frankfurt, Frankfurt School, founded in 1923, combined the true traditions in what was coined critical theory by Max Horkheimer and was developed most notably by Theodor Adorno. The second critique is directed to freeing us from captivity to a picture or a perspective. However remote their theories are, Nietzsche and Wittgenstein's endeavor to apprehend how people see the world and make sense of it from a particular perspective for the former, Nietzsche, or via common pictures for the latter, Wittgenstein. And their approaches, which imply that these perspectives are historically determined and that these pictures are culturally inherited, can be designated as genealogies. Of this approach, of course, Foucault is the most prominent contemporary representative. A major difference for Owen between critical theory and genealogy, as well uh, as a major source of disagreement between their respective upholders regarding what critique should do, is that critical theory Considers it, considers it possible to separate what is true from what is false, ideology being precisely what deceives human beings from blurring, by blurring this separation and thus allowing the reproduction of domination, while genealogy is interested in, identify, in identifying what counts for true and false in a given world at a given moment. Both concepts of picture and perspective not presupposing the existence of truth or falsehood, but emphasizing power and language game between the two. Emancipation therefore consists for critical theorists in removing the ideological veil imposed on people so as to allow them to realize the deception that renders their domination possible. And for genealogists, in contesting the self-evident representations of the world, they hold true while acknowledging the possibility of other representations. Although both approaches are analytical, critical theory is normative, while genealogy tries not to be. Hence, the misunderstanding between them. The distinction between critical theory and genealogy can serve to analyze how critique works in anthropology, although I will suggest that our approach sometimes com somewhat complicates and enriches this model. The research I conducted on urban policing thus falls mostly within the critical theory tradition. The 15 months of field work in the outskirts of Paris corresponded to a period when successive right-wing governments developed law and order policies that often resulted in violent interactions with low-income young men from North African and Sub-Saharan origins. The study revealed the contradiction with which the police were confronted since their performance was assessed on the basis of quota of arrests supposed to demonstrate the efficacy of the policy, while statistics showed, conversely, a regular decrease in crime. In order to, to attain their improbable objectives, officers are therefore to focus on immigration law and drug law violations, and they mostly arrested undocumented persons and cannabis users considering, considered to be easy prey. Based on racial profiling and without legal basis, these practices, which were associated with humiliating comments and rough treatment, led to permanent harassment of youth belonging to minorities. In fact, rather than enforcing the law, the police were enforcing a social order. Through their unlawful and debasing rituals that were known, condoned, and sometimes even encouraged by their institution, 
They inculcated these young men, and by extension, their family, families, the sense of inferior position they occupied within society. As these populations were also particularly affected by poverty and high unemployment, and subjected to discrimination at work and segregation in housing, the repressive policy implemented via the discretionary power of the police was a way to govern inequality instead of combating crime. And of course, we have many examples of that today in the United States. Interestingly, however, a significant difference with classical critical theory is that there was no false consciousness among the dominated minorities who were well aware of this mechanism and would occasionally tell me so. Ignorance was instead to be found among the majority, which participated in the domination without necessarily being themselves dominant. Indeed, after the publication of my work, while testimonies from people belonging to minorities expressed the sentiments that Charles, Charles Taylor calls recognition, when we say these things, no one wants to believe us, but now people will, they would comment. On the contrary, reactions from the majority when they were not of pure denial or, and dismissal, including among French criminologists, manifested a sort of revelation. For instance, a judge writing, I had always had doubts about youth accused of insulting the police and, and resisting arrest. Now I understand. This reversal of consciousness may be a not so unusual twist in critical theory. By contrast, the study I carried out on trauma and the condition of victimhood principally pertains to the genealogy tradition of critique. In recent years, trauma has become a familiar trope that serves to account for the consequence of violent events, either collective or individual, and covers a wide spectrum of situations from genocide to rape. The term is used in a clinical sense, validated by psychological tests, as well as in a metaphoric sense, referring to generic suffering, always in relation to a tragic experience. The identification of traumatic situations such as war, terrorist attack, or mass shooting has recently given rise to mental health interventions as well as financial compensations. Closely linked to the status of victim, trauma is thus a legitimate category as well as a legitimizing instrument. We tend to consider it as cognitively and morally self-evident. But has it always been the case? The answer is no. Until the 1970s, neither the scientific entity nor its moral connotation were stabilized. During the first half of the 20th century, traumatic neurosis was associated with simulation or hysteria, and those affected were suspected of deliber deliberate or unconscious duplicity. It is the mobilization of Vietnam veterans and feminist activists in search of, for the recognition of respectively war after effects and sexual abuse that led to the invention of PTSD, the post-traumatic stress disorder in 1980. With the cognitive consolidation came a moral inversion. The deceitful patient became an unfortunate victim. How did this dramatic change translate into actual practice? I examined specifically the introduction of psychological expertise in the assessment of asylum application in France. It came at a moment of rapid decline in admission rates due to a growing mistrust of claimants. Certification by mental health professionals became increasingly required by the administration and requested by the asylum seekers' legal counsels to attest to the persecution endured. The new situation created by what human rights activists called a torture bonus had three important consequences. The focus on the document contributed to discredit even more the word of the applicants. The quest for psychic evidence led to exclude those who had no such symptoms or did not want to expose them. And in the end, the whole process helped legitimize the drastic waning of asylum granting by providing a justification for the rejection. In sum, the psychological recognition of the suffering of victims of persecutions was far from having the virtues one could have expected 
or hoped. Critique as genealogies thus relies on an intellectual work of distancing from common sense and defamiliarization from what we take for granted. In the case of trauma, this dissolution operates at two levels. Cognitive, as the doubtful category becomes a stable entity. Moral, as the suspect patient becomes a legitimate victim. Acknowledging that the trauma is thus a cognitively and morally constructed reality does not abolish the experience of suffering, nor does it diminish the value of being recognized as a victim. Once the historical dissolution is achieved, the question indeed becomes, what does it change to have this recurrent configuration, the event, the trauma, the victim, rather than any other possible? The creation of this triptych has two major consequences, providing legitimacy to victims in general, independently of the cause since any event can be involved, with possible medical, economic, and statutory benefits, and eluding the political dim dimension of the relation, the account of asylum seekers vanishes behind the expectation of certificates with a significant lexical shift from resistance to resilience. Thus, with critique as genealogy, no ultimate truth is proposed, but rather a critical analysis of the effect of the production of distinct truth. In fact, in fact, one could envisage narrating the history of anthropology and more specifically that of its moments of engagement along these two lines, critical theory and genealogy, starting with Franz Boas in the United States, Bronislav Maninovsky in Britain, Marcel Mauss in France. What comes to be known as critical anthropology emerges, however, much later in the 1960s in a context of general critique of Western societies their values, their wars, and their imperial domination, both material and symbolic. Critical anthropology took on its most typical expression in the United States with the Marxist anthropology epitomized by the figures of Eric Wolf and Sidney Mintz, professed by Delheim's Reinventing Anthropology, and later expressed in the journal Critique of Anthropology. It was simultaneously a critique of the unequal world order and of anthropology, the latter being accused of accompanying and even giving scientific backing to the former as expressed in Talal Assad's anthropology of the colonial encounter. The critique of imperialism had become inseparable from the critique of anthropology since both were regarded as ideologically linked. From then on, anthropologists had lost their political innocence. The postmodern critique that emerges in the 1980s with the pivotal publication of James Clifford and George Marcus writing culture is of a different nature. The material under scrutiny is not society, but texts about society. What is at stake is, not, is no more the ideology of the discipline, but the discipline as representation. The critique is political, but it is about the politics of writing. The point is not the connivance of the anthropologist with the dominant, but the fictions they generate under the name of ethnography. Critics question their relation not to imperial power, but to scientific authority. They do not assume that social scientists are supposed to unveil a truth masked by ideology to protect interest, but that they are doomed to produce only partial truth in the dual sense of being incomplete and biased, whether they concern the political organization of the newer or the status hierarchy of the Balinese. Undoubtedly, the distinction between the critical theory-oriented critique of the 1960s and 70s and the genealogy-oriented critique of the 1980s and 90s is too schematic, and there are influences and passages between the two. Yet. Although the critiques of the second half of the 20th century combat the multiple avatars of anthropological positivism, just like their ancestors had fought ethnocentrism and evolutionism, they do so in two different ways. Some contest the political neutrality of anthropologists, while others challenge their epistemological impartiality. 
But is it an effect of the, of the presentism that tends to prevail when one examines ongoing facts? My impression is that over the past two decades, there has been an acceleration of the emergence of critical moments claimed to be radically new. One can think of the ethical turn, ontological turn, post-human turn, as well as the new materialism, multi-species theory, Anthropocene anthropology, to name just a few. My sense is that it may not be just a presentist bias. The academic world is in need of innovation and novelties, and academics are expected to create constantly and label or patent their creations. Anthropology is no exception. In, the, in that regard, it is rightly said that grand theories have disappeared from our field as they are from others, evolutionism, functionalism, culturalism, structuralism, Marxism, and a few more. But it is less noted that the isms have been replaced by turns, transforming scholars into whirling dervishes at risk of theoretical vertigo. I do not want to minimize the significance of the new approaches proposed and of the new questions raised, nor do I want to underestimate the publish or perish pressures uh, on academics. Yet, the chronicle of radical turns foretold sometimes resemble the reinvention of tradition, such as the current call for a return to the good, good old realism. And why not? Philosophers still think with Plato, sociologists with Durkheim, and economists with Smith. Critique should certainly not be confused with permanent intellectual revolution, especially when this revolution leads, leads us to talk only to each other and no more to society at large. So if you try to, ex to escape this high-risk scheme for the discipline and return to the core of what critique is, we have the Kantian principle of emancipation with an alternative between its critical theory version and its genealogical uh, interpretation. Is the anthropologist doomed to have to, to decide between the two options? From a philosophical viewpoint, Judith Butler has argued that it was possible to reconcile Adorno's criticism and Foucault's critique. I would like to take the discussion in the same direction but use another path, that of ethnography, or better said, using other shoes, those of the ethnographer. And I will finish with that. In the preface of the Company of Critiques, Michael Walzer distinguishes between those who seek only the acquaintance of other critiques and find their peers only outside the cave, in the blaze of truth, and those who find peers and even sometimes comrades inside in the shadow of contingent and uncertain truth. Prolonging, prolonging this rhetorical figure, I want to suggest that ethnographers do not have this choice to face. They stand on the threshold of the cave, alternately stepping inside and outside. As field workers, they are in the cave among the people with whom and about whom they conduct their research. As writers, they are outside the cave among their colleagues with whom and against whom they lead their reflection. Of course, this division of labor is as metaphoric as the cave is allegoric. But the crucial point is the following. As critical ethnographers, we know that we, what we owe to the critical sense of our interlocutors and informants as much as we know how we shape our own analysis in critical dialogue with texts and theories. We acknowledge people's social intelligence and our intellectual autonomy. This dialectic is to some extent specific to ethnography and even ethnography carried out by anthropologists without willing to claim a methodological exclusivity or a disciplinary homogeneity. The dialectic of the threshold has therefore both epistemological and ethical implications. Epistemologically, it indicates that the production of ethnographic knowledge is neither the mere unmediated account of facts nor the pure intellectual elaboration of theories. It is a co-production in which the author has at least provisionally the last word. Ethically, 
it recognizes the debt the ethnographer has towards the people with whom he or she works while not implying that they would, not, that they would be transparent to themselves. It is a co-production in which people have their say as well as their limits. This dialectic thus refutes the alternative between critical sociology and the sociology of critique that has divided French sociology during two decades with the opposition between Bourdieu and his former disciple Boltanski, prolonged through their epigones. On one side, Bourdieu's critical sociology, which achieves an improbable but successful synthesis of Marx and Weber, offers a general theory of domination. On the other side, Boltanski's sociology of critique, which finds its inspiration in North American pragmatism, provides a general theory of justification. For the former, critique is the project. For the latter, it is the object. At the risk of some simplification, one can say that Bourdieu considers that the role of the sociologist outside the cave is essentially to reveal to the dominated the mechanism of domination obscured by the dominance, whereas Boltanski thinks that, is, that this role inside the cave primarily, primarily consists in establishing a grammar of the arguments invoked and logics mobilized in disputes. Even in the last period of his life, even if in the last period of his life, as he joined the 1996 social movement, Bourdieu has attempted to enter the ring, did he not compare sociology to a combat sport? And even if after the death of his former mentor, Boltanski rediscovered the necessity of social critique after having distanced himself from it for two decades, both succeeded better in acknowledging the problem at the heart of their theory than in finding a solution to it. Whereas the two sociologies, therefore, do not seem reconcilable for the ethnographer, I think they might be. Accounting for people's social comprehension of the world that they, that they inhabit and analyzing social processes of which they only have a partial view is not only compatible, but necessary for the ethnographer. But <clears throat> while uh, doing so, the ethnographers acknowledge both the uniqueness of their approach and its limits. Ethnography is necessary, but not sufficient to fully develop a critical understanding of the world. The case of punishment, with which I will end, can serve as an illustration. In the common sense, as well as in legal theory and moral philosophy, punishment is defined as the infliction of suffering on someone deemed to have committed a wrongdoing. Under the retributive view, punishment is justified on the ground that a wrongdoing merits punishment. Under the utilitarian view, punishment is justifiable only by reference to the probable consequence of maintaining it as one of the devices of the social order. In the modern period, prison has become the cornerstone of has become the, the cornerstone of uh, punishment in modern societies. For instance, in France, where I have conducted a four-year ethnography in a short-term facility, prison population has increased by 240% during the last 60 years, whereas crime in the same time has declined, notably the most serious ones. The link between crime and punishment is thus thought to be essential for both the definition and the justification of the latter. However, the research showed that it does not necessarily exist. First, more than one-fourth of the inmates had not been sentenced and were therefore deemed innocent until proven guilty. In most cases, the decision to place them on remand had not depended too much, so much on the degree of suspicion or seriousness of the alleged offense as on the supposed probability that the person would appear in court. It relied entirely on a subjective assessment by the magistrate, which amounted to a moral judgment on the credibility of the indic indicted and led to the incarceration of almost exclusively low-income people belonging to minorities. As I could observe while attending dozens of trials, what was punished with imprisonment was not the putative crime as such, but the embodied social characteristics of the person as perceived by the judge. 
Second, within the correctional facility itself, the sanction of the violation of, of rules were often dictated by the necessity to set an example for the other inmates and to convey a message toward the officers, even when the members of the disciplinary boards not only had no evidence of the offense, but also admitted not to be convinced, convinced of its reality. In 85% of cases, solitary confinement was the sentence. The wardens justified the verdict by explaining that, that it was meant to maintain peace in the prison and even when the accusation concerned insulting or assaulting a guard to prevent retaliation by the personnel. Thus, ethnography led to reconsider both definition and justification of punishment and question legal scholars and moral philo philosophers' assumptions about them as well as common sense argument that legitimize sanctions as just deserts. But the self-evidence of punishment can be contested further by resorting to other methods, historical and statistical in particular, establishing that the majority of those incarcerated do not correspond to the usual representation of criminals, which serves to condone increasingly repressive policies. In other words, the point is not only what is punishment and why punish, but also who is punished and for, and for what. Starting in the 1970s, the punitive moment has been characterized by a historical shift in the severity of sentencing and a social disparity in its distribution. On the one hand, offenses that used to be subject to fines have been criminalized, with, for instance, the number of sentences for driving without a license being multiplied by five in the 2000s, and today, one out of 10 imprisonments being, being due to traffic violations. On the other hand, repression is differentiated by socioeconomic and ethno-racial differences, as, for instance, the number of sentences for financial crime decreased by one-third in the 2000s, whereas drug uh, law violations were multiplied by three, three and a half for marijuana users, with police targeting housing projects rather than middle-class youth for search and arrest. According to Emile Durkheim, we do not condemn an act because it is a crime, but it is a crime because we condemn it. As society chooses which offenses are worth prosecuting and sentencing, it simultaneously decides who should be punished and who should be exonerated. A young inmate once told me, let's face it, look out there in the yard. It's all blacks and Arabs. Us, we feel the injustice of justice. I was dealing pot. I'm not saying it's not wrong, but it's only marijuana. I never hurt anybody. I never stole from anybody. So when I see Sarkozy profiting from the riches of a senile old woman, or Cahuzac and the millions he owes in taxes, and they're free. Actually, three years later, neither the former French conservative president nor the former French socialist budget minister have been tried, and they might never be. The lucid analysis of the prisoner can be understood as a demand not only for more justice, but also for more critique of the injustice and more publicity for this critique. By calling the anthropologists as witness to a reality that everyone seems to want to ignore, the young man invites the critique to go public. This invitation thus complicates the allegory of the cave, since there are publics both inside and outside. In this particular case, inmates and their relatives, guards and wardens, probation officers and correction, corrections, correctional of, officials constitute various publics inside the cave, whom the anthropologist can address via the result of his research. While journalists, activists, politicians, legislator, the general public, represent other audiences outside the cave that can be made aware of what is too often ignored. In the end, the public presence of anthropology, as Thomas Ilan Erickson has it, is also what contributes to ensure the endurance of critique. So to conclude, in anthropology's house are many mansions. The richness of our discipline resides in, it, in its diversity. 
Whereas other fields, let us think of economics with rational choice, for instance, claim a single hegemonic paradigm. The diversity of our legacies is a hopeful sign of the liveliness of our futures. So let the nostalgia of realism and of the old moon prosper. prosper. Post-human approaches thrive. Ontologies flourish. Experiments blossom and turns turn. <laughs> but let us not waste the immense privilege society grants us, that of spending our lives studying the world and writing about it. Such awareness is, the more import is all the more important since between the legacies of the past and the promises of the future, there is the stubborn presence of the present. The least we can say is that our present is laden with worrying specters, disturbing construction of otherness, unsettling discourses on culture and religion, distressing oblivion of recent past, and denial of future challenges, notably in Europe. This is therefore not a good time for European anthropologists to relinquish the intellectual tool that has accompanied their development since the first faltering steps of their discipline, critical thinking. Critique is inherent to the anthropological project, most obviously in its genealogy strand, since it, their inquiry always comprises and sometimes even stems for, from a form of astonishment before a certain arrangement of the world. And we know that other arrangements would have been possible. And more disputably, in its critical theory strand, although more of our research than many, uh, than many would probably admit originate in a dissatisfaction or even an indignation before a certain state of the world, and we understand the cost of this state for many of those with whom we work. But this critique cannot be the preserve of our intellectual community. An anthropologist who cannot be suspected for having overused the word critique, Claude Lévi-Strauss, ended structural anthropology by this sentence with Durkheimian overtones. Anthropology would plead in vain for that recognition to which its outstanding achievements in the realm of theory otherwise entitle it if in this ailing and troubled world of ours, it did not first endeavor to prove its useful usefulness. There are many ways to understand what is to be useful for anthropologists and how to prove it. I believe the most crucial one in a world that is undoubtedly still ailing and troubled remains critique. Thank you. Thank you, Didier Fassin, I will say. Um, now we have time for a few questions. Hello, thank yeah, you. Sorry. My name is Mia Halmet Tuomisari. I represent Allegro Lab. I really enjoyed your talk. It was very provocative and insightful. But there was one problem that I could not over see, overlook. I'm wondering if it was possible to return to the last slide in which you represented all of the people that you quoted. I think you may know what I mean, but it actually still needs to be said out loud. In anthropology, we represent diversity. And we opened up this seminar, very, or this conference, very beautifully with the celebration of diverse voices. And we really did not really see diversity, but we heard diverse voices going from the male voice to the high-pitched female voice. And in this talk, we didn't really hear or see that. I, if you permit, a bit of humor is useful. Judith Butler doesn't really count because she's only performing gender, right? <laughs> so what we missed, we saw a panel of all white male. And I think it's an embarrassment in 2016 to say, congrats, you have an all male panel. Thank you. Thank you for your, your very subtle uh, and sophisticated tour of, of the various constructions of the world in different theoretical perspectives and the way these can be defended or, 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 or attacked. 
But what comes across to me most, most strongly in line with what you said about ethnography is that it seems to me your most valuable work all falls within a very solid old tradition of political economy. It seems to me that what you said about AIDS, about policing, um, and, and the other very, very interesting topics you choose for your research really falls quite squarely with what I will call a Marxist or a neo-Marxist tradition of critique <laughs> based upon the idea that the work of the anthropologist or sociologist is to, as it were, look deeply at the social order in order to undermine it. It's, I, I, you know, it, it's, it's, it's very old-fashioned what you're doing, and therefore it is good. Uh, and therefore what, excuse me? Okay, thank you. We'll take the last question. Uh, thanks very much for your, um, for your, for your talk. Um, I have a question regarding um, the relation of critique with uh, secularity or secularism. Um, it seems to me, uh, it has been argued by Tal Asad, Sabah Mahmoud and so on, um, uh, how, um, how critique has been uh, linked with um, discourses and practices of secularism. Now, <clears throat> it seems to me that Latour in his um, discussion of uh, critique in his a paper on, on, on the critique running out of steam articulated the possibility that um, uh, religion and, and you know the domain of what, what's been kind of categorized as religion and, 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 and secular critique there can be a bridge they don't need to be separated and if if in your um, paper I understand you you want to um, dismantle this, are we to return to a um, previous sort of division between these two domains? In other words, what would be um, this uh, relation um, of critique that you propose um, towards um, secularism and religion? Thank you. So I'm gender biased and old fashioned. <laughs> that's, that's a good start. <clears throat> uh, so you will, you will admit that I made the public aware of that by putting this picture, uh, a, a pictures at the end uh, for those who were not aware uh, just by listening to the, to, to, to the, to the talk. And I, of course, I was aware uh, not only white men, uh, some are not white, uh, but m many, many, many men in, in any case. And, uh, <clears throat> and this is uh, what I... Uh, what I realize it's not always the case in my work, but but that was the case uh, the case uh, today in what uh, in in what I I had to say. But but I, I think you're um, you're entirely entirely right to uh, to raise uh, that uh, uh, to raise that point. For example, if I had been speak, uh, writing about or or, or to, uh, talking about religion as I have done in, in other papers, I would have cited uh, other, uh, other names, female names. <clears throat> so on the second uh, point uh, about um, uh, neo-Marxism or political economy, uh, I may have stressed uh, uh, more that aspect, but I, uh, uh, in, but as I, try to explain uh, in, my, uh, in the distinction that I made between critical theory, which is basically a neo-Marxist theory and uh, with its Bourdieuian development, for example, uh, uh, in sociology, uh, and the uh, genealogical approach uh, and, uh, uh, with its uh, Foucauldian uh, development uh, and, and, and others, uh, Sabah Mahmoud, for example, um, I think I've tried to, uh, and in my own work in general, I've tried to combine these two, uh, these two approaches, and, and even if I uh, did not succeed tonight, uh, that, that was my point to, to show that, first of all, uh, these two approaches were two different ways uh, that had often uh, excluded each other, uh, uh, critical theory and genealogy, uh, when uh, some, from a philosophical perspective, 
and in my case, from an ethnographic perspective, uh, would, uh, uh, would suggest that the, the, the two uh, instruments or the two approaches uh, or the two forms of critique uh, can, be, um, uh, can, can be combined in the same, uh, in the same research uh, depending on what one wants to, uh, to, to, to show, uh, which is something that I had in my paper but I could not, uh, I was long enough and I could not develop. Uh, but about the thing about uh, all being old-fashioned, or, or, or these, uh, which I understand you, uh, you, you said with a grain of salt, uh, this, is what I, this is what I said about, uh, uh, about the turns, and, and, and I think there's a, a pressure for innovation, for uh, change, for new, uh, uh, new, new uh, concept, and we certainly, uh, must be uh, doing that, uh, but at the same time, uh, there's no reason why uh, we should abandon uh, either methods or theories that are or concepts uh, that we think are still uh, that are still valuable. And and it was not against, but it was in difference with a, a, a sort of. Uh, 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 trend that I tried to uh, to, uh, to 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 briefly uh, to briefly evolve. the question of the risks for the ethnographers, um, and that that would be the case probably for social scientists in general. But I understand that your point is that ethnography. Uh, puts you, in some cases, even more at risk than other approaches. And I entirely agree with, uh, uh, with this. Uh, in fact, I'm uh, editing a volume that is forthcoming, uh, the title of which is If Truth Be Told. Um, it will be published by Duke. And, uh, and it is a collective volume precisely on uh, how the work of uh, ethnographers uh, being um, uh, uh, in, in their relation with the public and with authorities can put uh, the ethnographers uh, in situation of risk. And, uh, and here we can think of uh, Foucault's uh, courage of truth. And, and this is, uh, and, and, I, and I, one of my arguments is that there's something specific about ethnography uh, which, um, which is the sort of obscenity that ethnography produces. You, uh, w when, you, when you write and publish ethnographies, especially when, when it's read by uh, a broader public than uh, just the, uh, uh, the academic circles, um, there's something of a shock in, uh, in depicting uh, uh, um, uh, the, the reality or the, or the facts or the events or that, you, um, that you have uh, observed. And, uh, and in, uh, in my experience with my book on the police, uh, for, for example, I've noticed that people were uh, shocked in a positive or negative way, but were shocked by every time by a very uh, precise description of scenes, uh, much more than they would be by uh, theoretical uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and broader uh, arguments. So I think there's something specific to ethnography and it's depending uh, on which topics you work on and of course which country you, wor uh, wor you work in, something about ethnography that puts the uh, the ethnographer at risk, and, and this should be uh, this should be underlined. And and finally, uh, <clears throat> about the so the I think the relation to um, uh, the, the the relation to religion and secularism of critique with religion and secularism is can really fall under the uh, two categories that I uh, discussed uh, following David Owen. Uh, critical theory and genealogy, and, and as, as you know uh, very well, 
um, uh, in, uh, <clears throat> uh, in, in the social sciences, uh, there has been uh, a, a tradition taking religion for granted and opposing it to uh, secularism, and another tradition showing that uh, this, was, uh, this distinction was a recent and even modern and Western uh, um, uh, uh, construction. <clears throat> And so, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a specialist of uh, secularism and, 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 and religion, but I think it, it, the, the, the relation to critique uh, falls exactly under these, uh, uh, these two, uh, uh, under this alternative between critical uh, theory and, and genealogy. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Didier Fassin.